Gary, we should be recording. I see that it's going. And so I'm going to assume it's working. I'm not going to try and interrupt it. We're just going to go forwards. Can we start with this, please? Would you introduce yourself? Okay, my name is Gary Nightsell, and I'm a member of MUFON. I joined MUFON in 1995 and became a field investigator in 1996. So I've been a field investigator ever, ever since. I was the Texas State Director from 2017 to 2020 and still working for MUFON. Nice to meet you. <laughs> so this is my first podcast. This is not the second. This is those will be the second time I presented this information. I've updated it a little bit. <clears throat> I'm going to run it through mostly like I did at the at the um, DFW MUFON meeting. All right, and I'm going to ask you questions, ask you to identify things. We're okay. going to play along, okay? okay. Um, obviously, it'll be different if I had 25 people raising their hand and fighting over what's right. <laughs> Okay. All right. Um, and and then if this works, maybe I will do more of these kinds of presentations. And I'm going to, with your permission, I'm going to put this up on, online and we'll just see where it takes us. Okay, sounds good. All right. So let's go to the PowerPoint and I'll introduce myself in the PowerPoint. Um, for those who don't know, Gary taught me everything I needed to know about MUFON. So let's start with this. Can you see the screen? Uh, no. No? Well, um, let me get out of this, and we will pop back in. After I do, let's see, I can do share entire screen. Um, share. Now, you should see what I'm seeing, and I'm going to... Um, yes, I see it. Shift this up so I can yes. I can click that. I'm gonna hide that now. You see what I see? Yes, I see that. All right. <clears throat> so this will be the first of the Moonlander podcast. If it turns out to be um, worth repeating, this is me. My name is John Eric Eggy. I'm a father. I'm this the assistant state director of MUFON of Texas, which. Um, doesn't mean anything special other than I was asked to kind of participate at this level and I caught a hot potato and didn't have the good sense to throw it down. <laughs> I'm a counselor in Texas. Um, I'm an LPC supervisor. I have a master's in community counseling. I have an undergrad in sociology. After um, five major shifts, um, I, I just wanted to know everything. Um, I'm presently working in mental health for the last 10 years. Um, 11 now, I guess. Um, I was a former airline employee, um, 24 years for American Airlines. Prior to that, I was an aircraft mechanic for a bit. I've, um, I was a music major. I crewed for a hot air balloon. I've been skydiving. I've been scuba diving. I've been almost everywhere in the world. Um, haven't been to Africa. That's a continent I'd like to go. Love movies, ghosts, and UFOs. Pretty good. All right. <clears throat> I, I titled this, You Are Not Crazy for Believing in Aliens. As a mental health expert, I hope I reserve the right to say who's crazy or not. Um, you could be crazy and still believe in aliens, but it's not because of aliens that um, you would get that designation. Um, I like this continuum the best. It kind of puts mental health in a way of thinking about it. I think of it in terms of wellness. People who are in a crisis are probably functioning less well than someone who is excelling in multiple domains. And so you could have some deficiencies in one domain but still function. Um, but overall, how you report wellness is usually how we in the counseling world define whether or not people are doing good or bad. Does that make sense, Gary? Yes. Uh -huh. All right. Um, Non-human yes. intelligence is real. Mental health is a separate matter. It is my um, hope that by the end of this lecture, you will have, if you are of the mindset there are no alien intelligence, um, that I will have persuaded you otherwise. Um, if you already believe this, and hopefully I will, you will find that some of this information is new to you and 
um, useful in ways of thinking about intelligence. All right, so let's start with this continuum. I have up here um, on one side UFOs, nuts and bolts, all the way over to cryptids. Now, if aliens are driving the UFOs, and that's my opinion they are, um, then aliens are kind of more like us, and they fall in the, towards the nuts and bolts category. Now, um, do ghosts and other cryptids and stuff fall along with the UFO? They do seem to be on the continuum, and I will show you um, who helped put that on the map. But in terms of MUFON, all we want to do is study UFOs. Here is the MUFON Field Investor Guide, the seventh edition. I had to, to read this and pass an exam, and then I had to demonstrate competencies, and Gary was the person who measured my competencies um, as I evolved into my role as a field investigator. Um, and so, MUFON investigates UFO reports. That guy pointing at the UFO saw a UFO, he puts it in MUFON CMS, and it gets assigned, someone like me goes and talks to the guy, and we try to determine what this person saw from reconstructing what they gave us and trying to use science as an overlay to see if we can put this in a box and have a measure of what's going on. Sometimes um, people see things that are quite normal. In fact, I would say most of the time. Even I have mistook Venus for something that it wasn't. It can be quite easy to do that because Venus gets to be pretty bright. Um, MUFON is the scientific study of UFOs for the benefit of humanity. It's our opinion that if we figure out UFOs, we can improve the world. Uh, that seems quite logical. Oh no! There's Bigfoot on a MUFON journal! What did I say? We're investigating UFOs, but at the time that I came in, this was still kind of, we're still kind of talking about it. And, and I think it kind of goes in fades, phases where we get more interested in cryptids and then we fall away from the cryptids. And, and part of that is because we've not been able to fully separate the paranormal from the UFOs. Um, and that's probably why Congress presently is saying there's interdimensional beings involved. Um, I don't know. Um, MUFON still is going to focus on the UFO reports, not the cryptid reports. And um, we have a group of people that we go to, like Opus, which um, they work with us, and they work more on the paranormal side of the spectrum. Um, but I like Bigfoot because of the $6 million man. <laughs> and what's interesting about this, and I'm going to connect all these things together. Don't think that I'm just being tangential, which I am. You can call me out. But Bigfoot, in this instance, was introduced by $6 million man who's NASA, um, or worked for NASA, and the lady in blue is an alien. How did he get to meet the alien? Well, Bigfoot brought him to her by going through a tunnel of light. Where have you, Gary, where else have you heard about the tunnel of light? Uh, usually when you die. Yeah, the, the near-death experience, that's exactly right. Which brings me to this. The valet's classification of types. Now, the close encounter scales is the one we're most familiar with, like Close Encounters of the Third Kind by Steven Spielberg. That touches on this scale. So if we use Steve Austin, man barely alive, as evidence for close encounter scales, he had a close approach. There's like Bigfoot staring at him from the, from the forest. Steve Austin found footprints and followed the footprints. He noticed he was being observed, and he observed the alien. He was abducted. Was he injured or um, killed? Well, we, we don't think he was killed in that episode, but um, when you're fighting as a $6 million man and not injured, I, I, I'd have to worry if, if that wasn't true. Um, on the top of the scale is the anomalous rating scale, which includes poltergeist, materialized objects, which are called aports. Um, there's near-death experiences. There's religious visions and miracles. There's out-of-body experiences. There's um, anomalous injuries or death. We can't explain why people died. Um, this is all on a continuum of outcomes that are frequently associated with UFOs. Did you have a question? 
Uh, I can't see you, so I I can't see raising your hand, and that's unfortunate. Um, So speak up and talk over me if you want. Okay. No no questions yet. No questions yet. So here's the first pop quiz that I gave the um, at the first lecture. What? So you want to be a field investigator? What is this? Go, Gary. Well, that looks to me like uh, Star Wars. Oh my Star God! Wars is space Trek. Star Trek. Star Trek. <laughs> Are you a Star Trek fan? I've watched a few of the shows, yes. Yeah. Okay, so um, everyone recognized this is Star Trek. Um, one person volunteered it was the Enterprise, and I said, well, how do you know? Um, and we all looked a little closer, and we can't find any identifying markings on it. Um, one person observed that this did not look like the traditional Enterprise that they know, um, and that would be true. This would be between the original episode, and it was showcased in TNG, The, the Next Generation, um, in, in two prominent episodes, um, um, Cause and Effect and Yesterday's Enterprise. And so it, it, this, this is a ambassador-class starship, and so now we have a ranking of it. We know where it's from. We, we, can, we can't identify the, the ship by the, by the number, but we also know the class and where it would fall on the timeline of Star Trek. The question is, um, has anyone, to your knowledge, Gary, uploaded the picture of the Enterprise? I'm sure, yes. <laughs> I actually have one, one guy that Ron introduced me to that did draw a picture. He, he made an animated picture of a saucer connected to two warp nacelles, and it looked exactly like the Enterprise. <laughs> and it was a pretty good um, thing. And now we have to wonder, is that guy nuts? <laughs> I want to see a flying saucer there. It, uh, possibly. Like, and, and so the, the question is, we've got to kind of look at a, a range of things. And I would say, don't necessarily rule this person out as nuts. Um, people don't necessarily see what they see. They see what they know. And let's say that they saw a flying saucer, but they couldn't make out the rest of it, and their mind just filled in the rest. That is plausible. Um and I, I'm going to try and um, show more of that here in a, in a bit. Um, but we see what we know. And hypothetically, if the one thing in our life um, rises to the level of spirituality, and I would suggest the um, Star Trek for me does rise to that level. It's a, it has a spiritual abstractness of ideals which appeal to me that if I had an encounter, I would probably put it within this paradigm. Um, And so I am more likely to see the future as optimistic based on um, the lore of Star Trek, which I think was the most utopian future possible for humanity. All right. I'm listening. (laughs) That was Fraser, by the way. So to to illustrate the concept, this this illustration is basically the Native Americans seeing Columbus. The story goes, and some people will call it a myth, and I'm here to tell you it's not a myth. People see what they see. And so they didn't see ships coming towards them. They saw clouds, except for one fellow, the shaman, who was disturbed. And he sat there and he stared at it until it came into resolution and... And then he told the people, this, this is probably not going to go well. <laughs> Depending on which history you get, um, that's probably accurate. Um, people who were on the low side of technology or considered primitive have not generally fared well. And that's a concern endorsed even by Stephen Hawking. We may not want to find aliens because they're going to just take over. I don't know if that's necessarily true if the aliens turn out to be like um, Star Trek and they have a prime directive. Um, We've been seeing stuff for a long time, as evidenced by this photo. Now, this photo, per the academics, is not showcasing a UFO. But instead, they would say this is just an image of God or a version of God. What's interesting about this is even your... Normal people and their dog are seeing this object. I find that curious. If everybody and their dog is seeing this object, is it still a vision? It's it's not like an 
a hallucination because everybody's seeing it. All right. But then my next question would be, which comes from Star Trek. Can anyone guess? Gary, you got an idea? Mm, no. no. Okay. Um, excuse me, sir. But what does God have need with a starship? <laughs> uh, so if that's a if that's God, God doesn't need a UFO. He doesn't need a spaceship. He doesn't have to present that way. But if he is, it, that's a curious thing in itself, because he's not just presenting himself or forcing himself on us. He's giving us clues that make us look up. This frame starts with a song. I don't practice Santeria. This is one of my songs that my son gave me. I don't remember knowing it before he gave it to me. He's nine, and I love this song. I'm going to have a lot of song references mixed in with this, this slide thing, and so I'm going to be testing you for recognition of slides and or if you can identify images. What is crazy? <clears throat> well, what is normal? Do we have a definition of normal? This book to the um, right is called the Diagnostics and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders. That's the thing that tells me what's wrong with people. I go through um, my routine. I gather evidence to support any one of the disorders that's in this book. Now, I have a few that I play with the most. I'm going to introduce you to those in a moment. Do dogs see God? So none of these classifications would actually apply to that dog looking at the UFO, right? What is normal? Normal is not defined by this book. It only defines disorders. Disorders are defined by society. The disorders that we recognize today would not be a recognized thing from the past. Um, do people have depression in the past? Absolutely. Do they have PTSD? <sighs> You'd be a fool not to think so, right? But they didn't have those disorders, and there's evidence that we import... The, the West imports our ideas of disorders to other people, and I recommend the book, um, The Exportation of Mental Health, um, Crazy Like Us. It's a really interesting book. And so, for example, in that book that shows um, Japan had no um, um, bulimia patients prior to a movie going to their country that showed Americans having bulimia, and then suddenly they had a thousand disorders show up at the psych psychosis, the mental health clinic, um, which is interesting. Um, we send a lot of people down to rescue those, um, or help the survivors of, the, of that island that had the tsunami and, and that lost like, what, um, a quarter of the population because they were all on the beach when that tsunami took out um, the beach. Um, and they all, the, the mental health professionals thought they would find PTSD. No one was reporting symptoms of PTSD, and no matter how hard they pushed those symptoms, they couldn't get them because that island had a different way of coping with crisis than we do here in the States. And that's an important thing to factor in. Culture affects mental health, um, and different cultures deal with mental health differently, not because they are different biologically, but because culturally... Our society, rule structures, and protocols affect the way we think, which affect the way our outcomes um, manifest. Here's another continuum. Do you recognize any people on here? <clears throat> I can walk through it if you want to um, decline. Yeah, go, go ahead and walk through it. Okay. So I'm going to start with the side that most people identify fast with, Jamie Foxx and Robert Downey Jr., I want to remind you of my wellness scheme from functioning to non-functioning. And for a moment, assume that there is no such thing as mediumship or ghost or um, archetypes or consciousness or anything like that. Robert Downey Jr. and um, Jamie Foxx, this movie is called The Soloist. Jamie Foxx plays a real-life cellist who ended up having schizophrenia and living most of his life on the streets in poverty. That's worst case scenario for most people with mental health issues. Best case is probably um, the gladiator guy there with um, Jennifer from A Beautiful Mind. This guy was super smart and he had schizophrenia <clears throat> and it helped him solve a math problem that no one could solve. He ended up getting the Nobel Peace Prize for that math problem. Um, in the movie, he has a very Hollywood way out of delusional thinking which I call Hollywood because I don't know that I know of anyone 
who has ever figured out that they were having hallucinations or delusions. But in this movie, um, Beautiful Mind guy, um, Nash, John Nash, um, realizes that his hallucinations have never aged in the 20 years that he's been knowing them. And that's how he figures it out. Um, Philip K. Dick is the author of quite a few shows, um, like or books, but uh, they became movies like um, The Minority Report, um, Total Recall. He had schizophrenia, or was diagnosed with schizophrenia. It may have given him insight to some of the things, like the Minority Report, <clears throat> in which he envisions a future where psych psychic spies try to um, prevent crimes from happening proactively. <laughs> they see what's going to happen. They send someone like Tom Cruise to go chase you down. Um, the interesting story behind it was he had a baby born, and he heard a voice tell him, take this child of yours to the doctor or he will die. Well, what do you do when you hear a voice like that? I know what I do. I take the boy to the hospital. He did, and it turned out that he had some kind of um, intestinal knot that would have killed him within 24 hours had he not had emergency surgery then. That's interesting to me. That doesn't mean that he actually heard the voice or that he intuited what was going on, but he did hear something, and, uh, I mean, was that voice real? Was it, was it, was it future knowledge? Was it... There's no, there's really hard to unpack because we don't know enough information. We just know that he reports hearing a voice. He brought his son to the hospital. They found something wrong. They fixed it. Now, um, down from um, A Beautiful Mind is Ingo Swan. He was a psychic spy for the U.S. government for almost 20 years. That's interesting. Is he nuts? Well, is he functional? Sounds like he's pretty damn functional. He, 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 he was paid by the government for doing something and um, few people supposedly can do. Above him is Francisco Xavier. Um, most people call him Chico. He's a um, medium and spiritist from Brazil. Below are fake um, mediums. Jennifer Love Hewitt and I forget this other lady, but they were mediums and they solved mysteries and talked to ghosts. Um, above them is Edgar Cayce, um, who was considered the sleeping prophet, and he really came up with some interesting things, including saying some people reincarnate from other planets. So, hypothetically, if we allow for reincarnation and mediumships to be true, um, I don't know, that would be evidence for s that we are souls living in a human experience, but we are not limited to human experience, and there's a whole universe in which we can dabble. Above him is a medium, Jennifer Schaefer, and a journalist and producer, um, Richard Martini. Richard Martini introduced me to Jennifer Schaefer, and they have a podcast. Um, it, it's a wonderful afterlife. Um, seriously, I got it linked below, and I, I recommend it. He interviewed the Michael Newton who wrote Journey of Souls, in which Michael Newton, a, a psychologist, um, PhD, was regressing people under hypnosis, and he found evidence of an in-between life in which human souls go to school and prepare for their next life so that we can keep learning and maturing um, ourselves, but also the planet. We, we participate in creating life on planets and evolving that life which I find is interesting because it links to Dolores Cannon, which says the same thing, and she was doing hypnosis too. Um, and Jennifer Schaefer is a medium who works with the law enforcement in California and other, other places to solve crimes. And she solved some crimes so spectacularly that um, had she not had alibis, they would have thought she was participating in the crimes. Jennifer Schaefer is a real-life medium. She works today. She's functional. She has a family. She keeps a schedule. She, she has work. She has a husband. She has grown kids. She does things. She feeds her family. I would say, if this was mental health, there's a vast difference from what she's doing and what the soloist was doing. And so functionality needs to be a part of your measure before you eliminate people saying they see aliens. 
All right. Daniel Brinkley was struck by lightning and then started talking to God and angels, and um, that's interesting to me. There's a lady um, illustrated here with the Stanford Anthropology who was also struck by lightning, Elizabeth Krohn, um, and she started talking to angels and had a near-death experience, and, and she's become a healer. And this guy above them, is one of the one of the well known recognized persons who had idiot savant acquired syndrome, or acquired savant syndrome. Not he, so he wasn't he was perfectly normal. He had this brain damage, and then suddenly he manifested the ability to do art. Some people manifest music abilities like they become a concert pianist, but no evidence of past um, abilities. And people can't explain this. With my luck, I have a stroke, and I'm going to end up in this wheelchair like Captain Pike with the only the ability to drool and say yes and no. I don't think that's fair. <laughs> uh, so, Alan Kardec. This is the guy that launched spiritism into the world, and it's probably most prominent in Brazil. Um, it's something I participate in. He defined the word medium, which is a mediator between the physical life, this third dimension life, and spiritual life. The presence of other worlds, the psychological and spiritual findings of Emanuel Swedenborg. Emanuel Swedenborg in the 1800s was probably the most prominent spiritual scientist of all time. He needs to be on your radar. You guys need to read him. I recommend him. But this book is particularly interesting because um, Mr. Dusen, Von Dusen, was a therapist working in the criminally insane asylum, and he w and he did something that I don't know of anyone else ever doing. He interviewed the hallucinations of the people that were wards at at the um, asylums, and what he found is more often than not, these hallucinations, these personalities, whether it's multiple personalities or attachments or um, ghosts or whatever possessions, they were grade levels of, of sophistication above the people who had the problem. That's interesting. Even some of the people, and you can read about it in this book, they would say, I don't understand what they're telling me. And, and Von Dusen would say, just tell me what they're telling me and then I'll educate you. And they would be at sixth grade le reading level, but this, the Hallucination would be at a PhD level, reading level. I find that interesting. It doesn't mean that this is necessarily evidence for aliens, but that the human mind is more complicated than we can even pretend at the moment. So what is a continuum? Well, that's usually going from good to bad or um, good to evil. Um, I don't like this. I prefer um, better. To, uh, I prefer a scale of different. What's helpful? What's not helpful? What's functioning? What's not functioning? Clearly, you can hear things and see things and still function, and you can be on the other side, as evidenced by being isolated, alone, depressed, on the street, not functioning, not able to pay bills. Keep that in mind, because functionality becomes the measure of well-being. You ready for a pop quiz, sir? Okay. All right. Um, tell me what Q brings to mind. What brings to yeah. mind? Yeah, you know, anything with Q. Does it remind you of something? You have a connection? Uh, well, there's a conspiracy theory, I guess, of Q. Uh, this guy? Uh, yeah. Yeah, this guy is Star Trek. Um, the character is Q. He was a non-corporal being causing a lot of havoc. He, he had a lot of qualities like a djinn. Um, in fact, this, this episode with this picture goes with him immediately meeting um, Captain Picard and saying, You're dead, John Luke. <laughs> I love this episode. It's called Tapestry, and it's, it's brilliant. Who's this? Oh, it's an old man. Let's see. Who would that be? Uh, I'm not quite sure. That's Q from James Bond uh, series. Okay. Okay. Do you, do you know why I brought Q in here? Not really. Not really? Okay. Well, Q 
is this other being, right, um, that may be a djinn or something non-corporal. Q in the James Bond movie had all these special gadgets, always making technology that was way ahead of its time. And I'm wondering, because um, who wrote James Bond, do you remember? Oh, boy. Uh, I watched all the James Bond movies. <laughs> Eon Fleming. Let me yeah. introduce you to something else Eon Fleming wrote. He wrote this, Chitty Chitty Bang Bang. He wrote mm -hmm. it as a kid's book. Yeah. This car is a magical car that was possessed by a genie. That's why it says Gen 2. It's not Genesis 11. It's not Genesis 2. This is Gene E. Um, and in the book, the genie was not was, was friendly enough, but it also was a bit sarcastic and heavy-handed. Um, I thought humans were kind of stupid. Um, now, if I introduce David Grush, saying that UFOs have been known since the 1930s, but Grush will take this further back, like um, probably thousands of years, but he says, I'm only authorized to speak up to 1930s when the Italians recovered a UFO. And Eon Fleming's was a real spy who later on began writing stuff like James Bond, and he's connected to Q and Jen. I, I wonder if there's a connection here. But maybe I'm just blowing things up out of proportion, and, and Star Trek and James Bond and Chitty Chitty Bang Bang is not evidence for soft disclosure. But hang on. Um, this statement here is, um, is a thing that Chitty Chitty Bang Bang is based on a true story. And if you read through this kid's thing, it doesn't introduce the gen, and I don't know that this guy knows just how real this story might be. Men in Black, um, they come in here, and I forget how, except that we're touching on tropes and probably um, uh, archetypes. Q is an archetype. Q from Star Trek is a different archetype than Q with the tech. Um, but gen are archetypes, and they seem to have knowledge that that transcends time. And it's interesting to me that um, anytime someone has an experience, men in black seem to show up, and they show up within, not even within 24 hours of the event happening. And it's, do they just follow these things along, or is there other things transmitting information, or are they time travelers? Um, I'm just going to ask all these questions because I'm linking stuff that may not belong, but th there's all this stuff does just raise more questions. Archetypes refer to um, roles, not tropes. So, for example, Luke Skywalker and Dorothy are the same character. They're both on a farm with their aunt and uncle. We don't know what's happened to their parents at the beginning of the story. They both go on journeys. They both find um, friends along the journey. One of their friends is a witch or a warlock that shows them the powers within them, not external to them. Um, the, the part where the powers within you, not external to you, would be the trope. All right. Um, they both find friends along their way. The Cowardly Lion and Han Solo, both the same character. They're always running away from a fight. Um, Toto and um, R2, they can't speak a lick of English, but they run to get help. Both of them. Um, the Cowardly Lion, well, we did that one. Tin Man, C-3PO. Can you imagine the witch telling Dorothy, um, Glenda didn't tell you what happened to your mother, did she, Dorothy? Join me and we can rule Emerald City as mother and daughter. Ruby lightsaber, ruby slippers. Can you see Yoda telling Dorothy, never your mind on where you were or what you were doing. Adventure, huh? Over the rainbow. Ha! Huh. Jedis crave not these things. And the evil emperor, he would have to be um, Oz, because who else would send a nine-year-old girl to solo, kill a witch except he needed a new apprentice, and you got to start them early, and in the book she was nine. Do you recognize this picture, sir? Are you still with me, Gary? It's a New Year's Day, 1939. Yeah. Uh, you know, There's I've, seen, a... I've seen it before, but I can't identify it. Yeah, so I got it out of an article. I linked the article at the end of this um, lecture. There's a UFO in the picture. And if this was 1939, I, I have to wonder what that is. Um, Gary, do you suppose this man in a hat is smoking a cigarette? It looks like it, yes. Yeah, it looks like it. Could he have inspired this archetype? <laughs> 
Uh, I don't know, but I just I find it curious. Fox um, Mobile Fringe, yeah. Yeah. Here's a 1942 picture of a UFO in China. It looks like a UFO. No, we, we know it was film. We know that they didn't have the ability to fake stuff like we do today, right? And and so, what the heck? And, people, and is that people, people pointing at it? Yeah. Right, I see that too. And so everybody and their dog sees this, right? I want to remind you that that painting from the medieval times. Everyone and their dog sees this. Who's this? Yeah, Kenneth Arnold. Yes, sir. What's he pointing to? Uh, what? That's where the term flying saucer came from. Yeah, but that's not a flying saucer, is it? No, it's not a flying saucer, but it's similar to what people see even nowadays. I know, which is curious. Now, Arnold is um, is given credit for um, making the term flying saucers blow up. Now, he did say that this moon-shaped object moved like a flying saucer skipping over water, which the reporter, a journalist, put in his description in an article, and that term stuck. Is it possible it stuck because everybody and their dog were seeing saucers? Yeah. yeah. That yeah. makes sense to me. Not that everyone just took to it because it was fun. Um, that, that's not what he showed, and if they showed that picture, um, flying saucers shouldn't have stuck unless everybody's seeing stuff, and we've been seeing it since the 1930s. There's that dog again. Everybody and their dog is seeing this. Do you see what I see? This is a book, but I like the title because it reminds me of a Christmas song. Do you see what I see? Anyway, I'm going to reintroduce you to this book in a moment. This is by Russell Targ, Memoirs of a Blind Biker, who was in charge of the remote viewing program for um, Stargate. Do you recognize these two? Uh, that's Side Dreamer and Genie, I think. Yep. Yeah. Keep going. Now, you know who who um, the fellow is? Do you remember his name? I don't remember the actor's name. Okay, I don't remember the actor's name at the moment, um, but he played J.R. Ewing, and this is Major Nelson. So, I kind of think television, especially science fiction fantasy, is soft disclosure. And so... When I talk about Q and the gin and the fact that NASA still puts ancient Latin on everything they launch into space, they're encountering gin and they're talking to gin, and that's why we have this I Dream of Genie with NASA as the, the comical piece that articulates around um, this, this powerful lady. You know who this is? Mm, no. No, that's okay. This is Chris Bledsoe. Um, oh, yeah, okay. Yeah, yeah, I've heard his name quite a bit. Yeah, and, and MUFON investigated his case, and, and, and Mr. Bledsoe and MUFON kind of um, had some falling out, it seems like. Um, but now Bledsoe is back, and he's making podcasts, and he he's telling his experience about the orbs and how... Some of them manifest as spiritual beings from ancient times, like um, I think he's met Hathor, and I think this is who the lady in white is supposed to represent. But he also made this curious statement on a podcast recently, introducing a NASA fellow who I can't recall his name, but he's mentioned by alias in American Cosmic, but has since come out. And I'll introduce American Cosmic here in a moment. Um, he stated that on his visit to NASA, this guy, who's the top of NASA official, says every person they've sent into space has brought something back. What did they bring back? Did they bring back poltergeist? The hitchhiker? Jen? I don't know, but when they say every astronaut has brought something back and NASA isn't disclosing that we're encountering aliens, then I, I'm... I've got questions. This is Dr. Pasaka. Pasaka. I think I'm saying it right. I'll, I'll, I'll verify when I see her book. But she, she wrote. So UFO of God was 
Chris Bledsoe's book, and she wrote American Cosmic, and she's saying the same thing. And in American Cosmic, she outlines and clearly demonstrates NASA is making um, prayers to ancient gods and putting that on a spaceship. And I'm thinking if you have to spend millions of dollars to make a spaceship, and it has to go through a clean room, and it has to meet standards, why are we adding weight and balance of even one plaque or sticker to something that is already taking millions of dollars just to, to launch? I don't know. Just questions. Um, this is um, Targ, Russell Targ, who wrote the book, um, Do You See What I See? I would be interested in knowing what his cat's name. I've not figured that out. But I'm going to introduce you to someone else. Do you know who that guy is? Mm. <laughs> I forget his name, his actor's name. Um, but he's a Ghostbuster character. And I forget the Ghostbusters character's name at the moment. It's terrible me. But this Ghostbuster ca character is actually supposed to be Russell Targ. <laughs> <laughs> and, and so Ghostbusters had some inside track to the paranormal and remote viewing. I see dead people. You probably know this movie. Um, that's um, Sixth Sense. Do you hear things and see things that others don't? All right. And so there are lots of ways to define this. People with disorders see things. People who are healthy see things. If I ask you this question as you're going into or out of sleep, 80% of the world's population will have at once experienced a auditory or visual hallucination as they go into or out of sleep. That's where we're, ha we're going to have hypnagogic, hypnagogic um, um, experiences. Do you know who this is? Oh, I've seen, I've seen that before. Yeah, this is Maria Orsic. She was a channeler or medium for the Third Reich, and she was supposedly channeling aliens to give them um, UFO tech design so that we could go into space. The UFO lore and the Nazis, uh, they pretty much originated at the same time frame, and there's a lot of UFO lore connected to them, Antarctica, and this lady. Um, what I'm about to share is me making connecting dots and may not have anything to do with reality. I'm just kind of asking questions. I, I could be crazy, but that's the funny thing here because I diagnose people for a living for the last, <laughs> the last 10 years, which means, um, what, it takes one to know one? Is that the same symbol? This is a Star Trek episode. Um, and you will find that pattern in the thing. And maybe it's just random noise and I'm making stuff up. But consider this. Gene Roddenberry was part of a think tank that was channeling aliens in the 1950s. Specifically, it was called Operation Penguin. I found some information on it, not enough to unpack a, a PhD thesis on it. But supposedly... The aliens called themselves the Federation. They, they had nine aliens that they were channeling. And that is why Gene is obsessed with the numbers seven and nine. You will find the Enterprise number, 1701, adds up to nine. Gary Seven was a character. Seven of nine was a character. Um, everything that was in the original Star Trek series came out of that psychic spy group in the 1950s and if the 1950s had a spy group and the 1970s had a spy group um, called Stargate wouldn't it surprise you if we still didn't have a psychic spy program you don't quit what works all right alien interview I want you to consider this book on your to read list um, she supposed this nurse supposedly um, had a psychic um, interlink with the alien that was rescued from Roswell. Um, what's interesting to me is the, the, the being was an android, but she was a soul that identified as female living in an android body for the purposes of her mission. And um, that symbol there 
at the top, the domain, private property, the solar system belongs to the domain, not the Federation. There are, per this book, two groups of people, the Federation and the domain. Galactic Federation and the domain are not seeing eye to eye, and, there, and there's some problems. But look at that symbol. That's not the Maria Orzik symbol or the lightnings on the SS things, but it looks curiously a lot like that. <laughs> so what is that? Is, it, is, is there a connection? I don't know. But then why did the Space Force adopt the same symbol? Why did China's Space Force adopt the same symbol? That is the Chevron. That is the Galactic Federation symbol from Star Trek. And, it, and if you look at all the space agencies, they all have chevrons. Are, are, are they telling us something? Do you know this movie, sir? No, I've seen I've seen, him. Yeah, that's Jimmy Stewart. And this movie is Harvey. Um, in the movie, he sees a six-foot rabbit, an invisible rabbit. And he calls it a puka, um, which is a playful spirit or, um, or something like sometimes mischievous, playful, mischievous. Um, and it comes out of the Irish folklore. This is the modern version of it, Donnie Darko. His six-foot rabbit was kind of scary. I didn't like this. It had this t scary tone all the way through it. But what's really interesting is it dealt with time travel. And apparently this young man was supposed to die, but he got out of sync and didn't go on an airplane crash, and consequently family dies instead. And uh, you need to see it. It's kind of convoluted, but it's, it's certainly fun to watch. Do you hear what others don't? PTSD, major depression, bipolar, schizoaffective, schizophrenia, substance use, and combinations of all of the above can result in seeing things and hearing things. This is usually attributed to illness, and the U.S. does not sort out the difference between spirituality and mental illness. You can have psychosis and not know what's going on. They call it psychosis NOS, not otherwise specified. You can have no identified disorder and still be hearing things and seeing things that other folks don't. doesn't mean you're crazy. It doesn't mean that you lack intelligence. It doesn't mean anything other than, for whatever reason, your brain, the way it's wired, is able to tap into something that many people can't. Sometimes our social structure and our language limits our ability. That's been measured by sociologists and anthropologists. Um, Here's an anthropologist example, which backs up the Columbus, the, the people seeing Columbus ships seeing clouds. Anthropologists took Polaroid cameras into the wild. They met people that had no knowledge of cameras or technology. And they took pictures, and they showed them the results that were instantly produced. Nobody could see themselves or their friends or anyone else in the pictures until they were educated how to see. You can't see what you don't know. So you could just be normal unspecified. I don't know. But again, hypnotic, hypnotic, hypnagogic hallucinations are the most common ways that people have visions. I will come back to this in a later section. Can you see what you know? Sure. Sometimes you will see what you know, even though what you know isn't always right which means you don't see reality right. We have a conscious way of seeing, we have an unconscious way of seeing, and it has been measured to about 80 milliseconds. So people can be put in an fMRI, a functional magnetic resonance imaging system, and they can watch in real time as your brain works through solving problems, and they know what you've solved prior to you knowing you've consciously solved the problem. They know what you're going to choose before you consciously know you're going to choose. And they can, they've can supposedly taken it up to 10 seconds. I find that one hard to believe. But three seconds is, is, seems to be an average. I want you to consider that for a moment. One, two, three. You now know something that you're doing, and you're thinking that's real time. But the guy over there in the lab says that he already knew what you're going to do. There's a time delay 
between experiencing stuff, processing it through the brain, and handing it up. I'm going to try and come back to that in a later section and reverse the trend. Your memory is not who you are. Your memory has elements of real stuff and constructed stuff. And every time you take a memory off the shelf, it usually gets added to or subtracted from. Every time we pick up a memory, we add something or delete something. What's interesting about near-death experiences is they've done um, longitudinal studies, and they show that these memories have the greatest integrity out of all other memories, and they don't have an explanation for it. Daydreams are not REM dreams, but we are not taught to daydream to the degree that we do have REM dreams. In fact, if you start daydreaming in class, most likely you will get interrupted and told to pay attention. Daydreams are more powerful than you can imagine. Um, multiple personality, dream characters. Are these archetypes? Are they aliens? Are they topas? Um, I'm going to explain the word topas in, here in a second. Um, I usually ask this question. Oh, Gary, do you know what a topa is? No. no. Okay. So no. imagine for a moment your brain is a personality simulator. It's a computer that creates personalities. Your personality was created by a number of things. Your family gave you stuff. Your biology gave you stuff. Um, at some point in your self-construction, you take over and you identify with things that you like, and those things get enhanced, and those things become your personality. But I submit to you that every person you've ever met in real life, on television, characters in books, are also being simulated in your mind all the time. That's how you have dream characters. Some of these are archetypes. Luke Skywalker, um, the witch from Dorothy, and Wizard of Oz. These are archetypes. Um, we can divide these up. Carl Jung did and Joseph Campbell did um, The Power of Myth. We repeat things in our lives due to the archetypes that we've adopted and due to the roles we've adopted. Some given to us, but mind you, the assumption is um, as we become older and wiser, we start becoming more interactive in who we are and what we are. Um, some people who have dreams think that other people are actually participating in their dreams, and I could allow that if you allow Carl Jung's collective unconscious also being um, a real thing and not just some um, alternative way to explain the transmission of archetypes culturally, other than books and unspoken language. Um, could aliens be archetypes? Or could they be other souls that we're actually talking to? Um, if you allow hypnosis, that takes us into the daydream place where we can actually access characters to the same degree that we're accessing them when we're in REM sleep, but with more consciousness attached to it. Again, I'm just asking questions. I don't know if this is real, but I know that we don't study hypnosis partly because there's probably an economical incentive to squash hypnosis. If hypnosis works and people experience remission of illness, not just treatment of symptoms, but remission, pharmaceuticals would not want to compete with hypnosis. Now, that doesn't mean that hypnosis doesn't work. It just means that there's been an economic incentive to squash hypnosis the same way they don't really want to um, explore whether or not placebos is a real thing, even though they have to factor that into their medicine um, in the studies of make, determining whether or not medicines are functional. Topas are thought forms. Um, thought forms are accidental and or intentional. Like, let's say that I'm creating a story like uh, The Wizard of Oz, and I spend so much time in it that Dorothy actually becomes real. I experience her in my mind as a real person. Sometimes I hallucinate her. Sometimes I hear her voice. Authors have experienced this. They have a different name than topas, but topas is a word that comes from the Tibetan um, that describes the same thing that I'm describing here. Um, this is three images that I like that helps illustrate that we do not see the world in real time and we do not see the world for what it is. Now, the... One image over here with the, with the obvious dots, 
there's a lady there. And some, most people see the lady, um, but it is an illusion, not an actual lady. It's just the way the dots are, are shadowed and, and, and the way your eyes see things that the lady kind of stands out. Some people can't see her at all. Now, same dot matrix in the middle, but there are colors in this image that you can't see because your eye is limited to, to certain, certain spectrums. People who are colorblind, um, we know this because we can do something like this that eliminates different colors. And if you're not colorblind, you see the number or letter that's manifesting in this image, or you don't. And if you don't, you're colorblind. Now, this last one here is a stereogram. Now, I don't think anyone can see it from this image here because I copied and pasted it. Um, but if you know how to do this trick, you will see the USS Enterprise stand out and be floating in front of your face just as clear as day. Now, if you don't know how to do this, you'll think this is just a bunch of static. Um, I don't know. Is this what they mean by collapsing the wavefront? Could the entire universe be static and when the observer sees it, we manifest it? Just curious. Shall we continue? Do you need a break? Oh, I'm okay. All right. So, who's in charge? This is a lovely book by a psychiatrist um, and neuroscientist, Michael Gazanica. I recommend this to people, mostly because it talks about perception. It didn't include the 80 millisecond study. I, I don't think it did. But it did include this one really interesting study, that, my most favorite one of all. Um, people with epilepsy had an experimental surgery done because um, epilepsy was likely going to kill them. So what they did is they separated the hemispheres. They cut the corpus callosum out of the brain. And so now you have two hemispheres. They're still attached at the, um, at the, at the root of the neck. The, they didn't completely remove the second thing. And I don't think you could do that. But the brain is still connected to the body, and so the right hemisphere controls the left side of the, the body, and the left hemisphere controls the right side of the body. All right? And what they found is the, the left side, which operates language and logic, controls the mouth. Um, right side is more abstract, but when they cut the brain in half, they discovered two separate personalities, radically different from each other. All right? That's interesting to me, but what's also interesting is the left always had an opinion about something. It, create, it created a myth. It lied. The word is confabulation. That's a clinical term because lying is different. Than, because it wasn't lying maliciously to get needs met. It was lying because the left brain makes up answers so it can understand the world. And it doesn't matter how simple this was. So, for example, they figured out how to talk to the right brain without the left brain knowing what it was being said to the right brain. And the right brain could hijack the body and go get something to drink or whatever it needed. And so if you tell the right brain, go get some water and then come back and sit down. And then you ask the left brain, what just happened? The left brain never said, I don't know. Um, it would make up some nonsense answer like, well, you know, my car needs gas and so I got some water. It, and it's just bizarre. Uh, no matter what they asked it, it, the left couldn't tell the truth to save its life. Because it didn't know the truth, partly. Because, like, they figured out how to show two images to it. And, like, they'll put a hammer for the left brain and a saw for the right brain. And they'd ask the, the left brain, well, what did you see? And it said, I saw a hammer. They said, well, can you draw what you um, saw? And so the left hand would draw a saw. And he's like, well, that's not a hammer. And it, no, I... But it's probably in the toolbox, and so that's why I drew it. <laughs> it's really interesting. Um, this guy, Think and Grow Rich, um, Napoleon Hill. Have you ever read this book? No, I haven't. This is the single most important self-help book ever written. It is still the standard for which all self-help books are written. And in this book, he had a technique called the Invisible Counselor Technique. Really interesting technique where he said, um, I believe the unconscious holds answers to questions, but my personality is limited, and so I'm going to invite personalities that inspired me or I aspire to become like and see if I can't get better answers. And so, for example, Napoleon Hill, Einstein, these big important thinkers of the time, he invited them 
or from history, he invited him to participate in a meditation exercise where he'd meditate where he's sitting at a conference table and these folks would come and join him. And he'd ask them questions about life and the universe and how he can um, survive. To his surprise, they showed up. And he has a ritual for doing it, like you need to invite them formally by writing letters, their steps and protocols, all of which are in this book. Um, it's chapter 14, The Invisible Counselor Technique. And I challenge you, you, you can do this, you can ask people about this, and many people will say they have read this book. Very few people will say they know that chapter. It's almost like that chapter is invisible. They can't see it. No one wants to talk about this chapter because there's some weirdness in it. So, for example, Abraham Lincoln came to the meetings, and he started being autonomous. It wasn't Napoleon Hill scripting these meetings. It would be these people were participating in a meeting. Abraham Lincoln always showed late. He would not sit down. He walked with his hands behind his back and his head bowed as if the weight of his thoughts made his head too heavy to hold up. It was really bizarre, so bizarre that Hill gave it up for a while, but he could not deny that the answers he got were not from him. Um, he just did, could not believe that those were him. This book is called Magic and Mystery in Tibet by Alexandra David Neal. She is the first woman anthropologist allowed into the heart of Tibet in a time that um, rivals, what, seven years in Tibet with um, that movie with, um, what's his face? Mary the Friends Girl. Yeah, but that one. That's why I need a group. I don't remember all these names. Brad Pitt. There you go. Um, so she went in there, and um, she was allowed in because she knew more Buddhism um, than anyone that the Tibetans liked from the West, and they thought they wanted to receive her company and, and instruct her further. And so she learned about topas. Now, the Tibetan monks had this practice where if you were afraid of something, you had to learn to manifest it as a hallucination. You had to think about it so much. So if you hate spiders, you had to think about spiders so much that you could see them crawling on you. And when you eliminated your fear, you would dissolve the spiders. And she says, so that's pretty cool. Can you do that with people? And they said, oh, yeah, that's, that's possible. And she's like, so I could do this? And she says, no, we don't want you doing that. And like, but, I, but I'm curious. And yeah, we don't want you to do that. They, these things can run amok, and they affect people in society. Well... Being a Westerner, she decided she's going to do it anyway, and she thought she'd do something benign. She created a Friar Tuck topa. Friar Tuck was part of the Robin Hood gang. She didn't take into account that just being part of the Robin Hood gang probably means you're a bit mischievous, even if you are stealing from the rich and giving to the poor. And she started having problems with this fella. He started being mean to her. He started straying um, and causing problems among the village, so much so that the villagers finally called <laughs> the monks back to dissolve Friar Tuck and make him go away. Um, this has become a fringe thing here in the U.S., and people participate in it. I participate in it, and I will introduce you to my topa here in a bit. The Red Book by Carl Jung. This book nearly didn't get published. It's a really interesting book in which he engaged in this process called The Act of Imagination, and he discovered he had a spirit guide by the name of Philemon. I would like to submit to you that this technique that he uses to get access to, the, to Philemon is the same thing that Napoleon Hill was practicing and what Alexandra David Neal gave us. Do you recognize this picture by chance? No one else did, so it I'm looks, not... Is that, uh... Almost looks like Stan Friedman. I'm not quite sure who the guy in the beard is. Yeah, that's not Stan Friedman. I forget who it is. But um, you can Google this, and you can find this picture. I thought it was quite a famous picture. I recognize it, but no one else in the class recognized it. And that's okay. It's not about that. Um, I'm just curious what images stick in people's mind. And so part of my questions and showing things. And, and if I were a better researcher, I'd have the name pop up on the next slide. Um, but this experiment is called the Philip the Ghost Experiment. So they have some mediums here, and they have some scientists here. And the scientist folks said, I think mediums are a bunch of malarkey. And so what we're going to do as scientists is create this ghost. We're going to call him Philip. They gave him a history. He was, a, he was not a really nice ghost, he, and he ended up dying not pleasantly. Um, 
And so they called the table together and they had this mediumship thing going on. And the mediums access Philip. And Philip gives the history as defined by the scientists. Which is kind of interesting. Because now we're either talking about ESP and somehow the mediums are getting the information psychically from the other people. And every time a scientist uses that explanation, I at least, well, at least that means psychic, um, psychic abilities exist. Can we start studying ESP now? And they're like, no. <laughs> so, so they dismiss that, right? But they'll, they'll use that as an explanation. So maybe there's a, there's a ghost there, and it was listening to the things. I'm going to play along with this, these folks, and I'm going to scare them along. I don't know what's going on. But now that you guys know about Topus and the invisible counselors and Phil, um, Philemon, what if this is connected to those three? CE5. Richard, um, is it Greer? Richard Greer? Stephen Greer. Stephen Greer um, brought this to us, but it's really not a new thing. I think there's other versions of it out there. And hypothetically, if we live in a conscious universe and consciousness is first, prayer should work. Anything you speak or think would radiate out from you, would respond, the universe would respond in kind. And so if you go looking for something, you're probably going to find something. If you go looking for something in a group, your group is probably going to call something to you. Um, if they're jinn and they're paying attention, I don't know. Some people would say, don't do this because you don't know what you're getting. Fair enough, but I'm a scientist. I, I'm going to go do this, and I'm going to go with people too because hopefully I can run faster than the guy that gets eaten. I don't know. Um, but then if that's true, then does it this stand to reason? This is, this is a, what, planchette? Or Ouija board. Um, but I find it curious that that thing looks like that. The seeing eye on the pyramid, the upside down heart with an eye at the top, is that the same? Oh, isn't that the same shape? That's Star Trek. This is Loxy. She is my spirit guide and or Topa. I've moved more from Topa to thinking she's more like Philemon, um, which is interesting. And I've met people who have read about her who are telling me, they're reporting this, I'm not able to verify the accuracy, that they've had experiences with her since I've introduced her to them. I find that interesting. Did I just do the Philip Ghost experiment? I don't know. I just know that this lady has been very helpful and kind of unpacking some of my past trauma and stuff. And there's, let's just say that I'm, I have fallen on the mental health spectrum, probably why I'm a counselor. My family certainly did, it's probably why I'm a counselor. I'm the stereotypical counselor that wanted to heal his self and his family. Um, and so I have past trauma. And so maybe I access this stuff a little bit easier than most. Um, or I'm more wishful thinking, or I've got a more creative side of the brain. I don't know. I just find this interesting that it works. And the first time I heard her voice, as clearly as I'm talking to you, Gary, she spoke these words. Um, well, let me pose the question, because it's important. I wanted to go, I, I told her, look, I have this problem, and, and I'm tired of how we get bound up in these stories. I want to go from point A to point B with no tangents, just straight to the point, just answer this question as best you can. And her words were precisely... Lightning never takes a straight path, and it lights the whole sky. First thing that happened was I came out of my chair looking for who was behind me, because that's how loud it was. After my heart climbed down, <laughs> I started unpacking that. It reminded me of rooming. Um, um, of course our hearts are broken. That's how the light gets in, you know, kind of kind of like that. Um, and then I remembered one of my favorite movies, Joe versus the volcano. So these images are from Joe versus the volcano, and it opens up in the middle with this long, crooked path going towards the building. The top picture is actually the logo of the company, but that's also the door that opens up the Let's Joe in, um, which is interesting and metaphor at the same time. And at the bottom is the volcano, and the same path he took to work every day was the same path up to the volcano in which he was going to jump kind of symbolic of life. It became the symbol for RKA radio pictures, 
uh, artwork. This picture here is from the movie. Someone broke, Dr. Gray No More um, broke the wall. Gray No More doesn't age. Gray No More, that's interesting. There's a lot of interesting things in this movie. I recommend watching it. He breaks the wall and that pattern appears. I think it reminds me of Maria Orsic in the Vril Society. The lightning that sunk the boat that um, Joe was on. Same path. So, Loxy wanted me to introduce you to my Invisible Counselors. I decided to practice this thing that um, Think and Grow Rich did after being successful with um, Loxy. And I introduced um, Carl Jung. He was the first guy to respond to my letter campaign. And that's an interesting story. Um, <clears throat> I brought in Tesla. And all of these people kind of overlap in some dimension. They're all spiritual in some ways. Um, I figured you need a strength character, but you need to bring humor because you can't have strength without some humor. Um, I brought in Uhura because she's what Star Trek and because she's fiction and I wanted to know if I'd have a different result from someone who's fiction. I brought in Sacagawea because I needed a Helms officer and I brought in the goddess Isis and tell me sir, if you remember this episode with Spock holding the cat, what was the name of that cat? Well, I don't know. <laughs> Isis. Okay. This was Gary Seven's cat. The time travelers were the Egyptians, and Isis was helping Gary Seven correct the world. And if that's true, could that explain the Mandela effect? So that song, um, I Don't Practice Santeria, one of the lines from that is, I got no crystal ball. Um, but if you consider dreams, again, I think this is important, including daydreams, all of these items here, DNA, Einstein's theory of relativity, the movie or the book Frankenstein, the periodic table, the structure of the atom, Salvador's Deli's persistence of memory, the Terminator, they all came from dreams. Don't dismiss your dreams and don't dismiss your daydreams because your brain is solving problems vicariously through stories. Imagination is more important than knowledge. Knowledge is limited. Imagination circles the world. We're going to continue unless you need a break. No, I'm good. All right. Telepathy. Is this real? Biologically, spiritually, or technologically? Well, I can tell you technologically they can read your mind. These are some earbuds in which companies would like us to start wearing them because they can tell whether you're gossiping, whether you're doing your job, whether you're surfing the Internet. They can tell you what you're doing and get you back on task. Not a fan, but I wonder why we don't use um, these kinds of technology to better condition our biopsychosocial rhythms internally. So biofeedback's a real thing, neurofeedback's a real thing. We could make ourselves healthier, but we use it to control us and enslave us as opposed to helping us live better, healthier lives. This guy here, Stanley Krippner, he did a study with... Um, the Grateful Dead, he did a psi experiment. He wanted to know if um, people looking at pictures in the background of a Grateful Dead concert could, could send this out telepathically and there'd be receivers that could collect it. Um, probably the biggest study of its sort. And I've spoken to, well, I've, I've corresponded with him about topas and such, and we had a nice conversation. And um, he's connected to the spiritists in the sense that he went to Brazil and studied them and recognized that they were treat some of the psychiatrists that were spiritists were helping people with trauma by also sorting whether or not this was this life's trauma versus past life trauma or other spiritual things that need to be healed. America's system is biopsychosocial. Brazil is using biopsychosocial spiritual. And I think that's an important distinction and we are failing to meet some of our domains and we're out of balance. That's my opinion as a professional therapist. Um, Rupert Sheldrake um, was also studying telepathy. He started with that sense of being stared at, but he's also done this study where um, he's monitoring pets to see if they really know when people come home because a lot of people report their pets are waiting for them even though they're not on schedule and they only go to the door when they're about to arrive. That's interesting to me. Now, Keep this in mind, it doesn't have to be telepathy, and I'm going to introduce something later on here that could also explain it. I'm just asking these questions. 
And these guys are asking the questions, and they're being really scientific about it. So, for example, some people reported they know who's on the phone before they picked up the phone. Now, that's changed for us because we're all using cell phones, and our cell phones usually have caller ID. But they have a way of doing some scientific experiments where they can take the caller ID off, and you answer the phone blindly, and if you know who it is before, before, the ID, before, before you know who's speaking, that's scientific information. And if it's greater than 60, well, then are you doing remote viewing? Are you psychic? I don't know. Um, Japanese can record your dreams. Actually, we can too. If we can put you in an fMRI. We can teach the AI computer to monitor the way your brain processes information, and we can see what you see. And we can play back your dreams. If we are not as advanced as aliens, and UFO tech is real, like 100 years or 1,000 years ahead of us, they can read our minds and they can speak telepathy, whether that's computer or tech or bio or spiritual. I don't know that we can make a distinction at this point in our game. Um, but if we can do this, they can do that. Just, just kind of thinking that through. And also this, if the government says, that if, if the scientists say that we are about to have AI within the next 10 years or 15 years, and the military is 50 to 100 years advanced of civilian tech, we already have AI. Why are we messing around with rocket engines and, and war when we could just have a peaceful existence exploring the universe like Star Trek? This is... Dean Radin. I love this guy. I watch all his lectures. And he wrote this book, and he gives example of almost everything I've talked about in terms of um, bizarre happenings that look like ESP or suggest that we are more interactive with the universe than you think. And in this book, it has a protocol for you to practice magic, and you decide for yourself, just like you can with um, Think and Grow Rich or Topomancy or Active Imagination. You, can, you don't have to sit there and just watch things happen. You can participate. That's why you're here. You're here to participate. Do you see what I see? You can learn to remote view. You don't have to sit on the background and just believe someone else's statistics. In fact, everyone that came to the remote viewing um, um, place where they were working, the what, NRI, N SRI, SRI, I think that's right. Anyway, People would come to take away the funding, and, and TAR would sit them down and have them go through the protocols, and they would interrupt them. Well, wait, wait, wait. You're asking me to do this? And they said, yeah, you can do this. And he said, I'm not psychic. And he said, well, just do the protocol with me, because all we're doing is learning a protocol, and you can learn a protocol, can't you? And they agree, and they do the protocol. And everybody that does this the first time gets a super solid hit that convinces them they're psychic. And they go away, and, and they, they kind of stay silent for a while. Um, this is, again, Ingo Swan. These are some of his books. My favorite is Penetration and um, The Psychic Sexuality. I highly recommend these books. Um, put as much knowledge in your head as you can, and then do experiments. Ask questions. We're going to continue. Do you know who this is? I've seen that picture before. Uh, yep, it's a very famous picture. I'm going to interrupt you. Um, does this help? Okay. No, <laughs> it doesn't help. But um, this movie is called Lucy, and um, the first image is actually the recreation of what we think the skeleton Lucy would look like had she been alive, and that was science making Lucy look real. This movie includes time travel and ASP and almost everything else you've got going. Consciousness is a part of it. It is a great movie. I wish there was less killing in it, but... Um, it gets to where it needs to go, and it's a great movie. Um, is that movie based on Lucy? Uh, I think what's that? It's someplace in Africa they discovered her. You know, which, um, think, so uh, the movie technically is not about that, but this this ape and and the one this this is technically not an ape. This would be the representation of the first human in Africa. Yes, sir. And her name was Lucy, and the the image prior, that one, is also uh, a depiction of Lucy. Which goes back, what, like three million years or something like that? Yeah. Like, three million years. Yeah. She would be considered the first homo, homo, homo sapiens. I think she'd be homo sapiens sapien. 
I may be a, wrong on that, but maybe, maybe Homo erectus. Uh, or, yeah, I, I don't know. That's a great question. This is not my expertise, but I am curious. Even the first Homo sapiens sapiens, I wonder if they would look anything near as Homo sapiens do today. Um, and would we recognize our own? Would we recognize the ones that came right before us? I would suspect they look more like us than Lucy. Uh, maybe. Uh, yeah. yeah. Um, do you recognize this? <laughs> uh, this is a famous UFO thing. It's the Cass Landrum um, yeah. incident. Yeah. The one down to Houston. Yeah. And, and so knowing the previous picture of Lucy and this diamond-shaped craft, does anything ring a bell yet? That's okay. Well, maybe this will help. You recognize this one? Uh, is that no? So this is the England one, and I forget where it's at. It's a famous picture of a diamond-shaped UFO and a harrier in the background. And it's been authenticated recently, though the original photo is mysteriously lost. Once again, some craziness in the UFO field. But I wonder if you know this guy. Oh, yeah, I've seen that picture before. Yeah, so this guy is um, Corey Goodman. He created this concept 20 and back where he was part of a program where they, the Secret Space Force took him into space. He served a 20-year mission. They, they regressed him back to the age at which they abducted him and put him back on Earth where he lived out his life unknowing um, that he spent 20 years in space because they erased his memory. After he released this concept, there were a dozen other people that started saying, yeah, I'm, I was part of that program. And then Corey got a little territorial, and he decided to sue everyone, saying, this is fiction, and it's mine, and you can't borrow it. And so kind of bothered people because here it was. It was supposed to be real, but now he's taking it back. I think I was part of the program. <laughs> but I could be dreaming this, and it could have been the nightmare. And it could also have been... I was influenced by too much media. I'm going to prove to you that we can be influenced by media, and I would suggest if I'm about to, if what I give you is right, Corey was also programmed. They don't call it TV programming for nothing. Do you recognize this image? Probably not. No one's going to recognize this unless they're a hardcore Beatles fan. Mm -hmm. This is Lucy in the Sky with Diamonds. Okay. <laughs> okay. Um, do you know what... Um, what what album or movie this was featured in? No, no that's okay. You're not a Beatles fan, clearly. It was. This is. I was, I was more of an Elvis fan, I guess, than the Beatles, but. Yes, yeah, uh, all right. Do you recognize this image? Twenty thousand leagues under the sea. This is the flying sub. Okay. It's yellow, and this was something I watched growing up. I I I loved these shows. This is the Beatles, the Yellow Submarine. I'm wondering if the 20,000 Leagues was connected to this, because Lucy in the Sky was also in this. And I will tell you, they traveled in space. They traveled in air. They traveled in water. So it's the first transmedium craft. In the UFO lore, the Navy was the first ones into space. And I'm telling you, we were in space around 1924, and the first man on the moon was in 1955, not 1968. And... Oh, 69. Yeah, 69. Thank you. That's right. Because I was born in 68 and my dad was holding me while watching that thing. They get older while they're traveling. They travel through time again. Um, and time... Well, let's go back. Time is measured differently wherever you are. Um... They get regressed back to their younger age. They fight reptilians. I don't know why they invoke the Seventh Cavalry because they weren't really known for being nice. They fought the Blue Meanies. The Blue Meanies are part of the UFO lore and they are part of near-death experiences and they most often are considered to be the medics. They help us heal. Why is the captain of the Yellow Submarine crying? I don't know. Could it be he invited the 7th Cavalry along and he's regretting something? Um, or they invoked the white whale with the yellow submarine. Was he Ahab? Oh, 
I don't know. Um, I invoke Star Trek with this um, because of this. This is a quote from um, First Contact, and there is referencing Ahab. And this is the first episode in which Star Trek has a um, biracial kiss. Which promoted the song Blackbird by the Beatles. The Beatles were watching that and they said, you go Blackbird. And, and then this song was born. And so it's kind of connected. And then there's this mystery. Did Paul McCartney die in 1965? That's interesting. Uh, I'm not saying he did or didn't, but <clears throat> there's some interesting correspondence. And, and then when you add the Mandela effect, we got some mystery here. This would be evidence of the Mandela effect. People remembering things that aren't supported by the artifacts that were carried through time. Um, do we remember what we remember, what we're told to remember, or what we tell ourselves to remember? How does hypnosis work? You get told to believe something. Do you know what this is, just in general? Mm. It, this, is a, this is a virus landed on the top of a cell. Okay. If viruses need hosts to replicate, the question is, where did the first virus come from? What came first, the chicken or the egg? That's an interesting question. And we're wondering if viruses are actually alive. That's an interesting question when you consider this. This image is, is of a cell. In fact, you've probably seen this in a high school biology class. Even though it has changed, this image hasn't changed, and we're still teaching this. Per the science, watching cells underneath a functional MRI in real time, AI has discovered twice the number of functional artifacts in living cells. We don't know the half of it. Half of it's invisible, mostly because we used to do still frames. And, and in order to see this under the microscope, we'd kill it, we'd stain it, and the stain would bring out these, these structures. You'd have to have several different kinds of stains so you can see different structures because some, some structures take some of the dye and some ignore the dye. And so there's a whole host of invisible things to us that we can't see, and some things can't be seen until you watch the motion of the fluid moving through the cell in real time. I wonder if that's true about space. Here's a photograph of a brain cell and an astronomical picture showing that the structures are similar. I'm not saying that they're the same. Some people say it's the same. There's correspondence. And it just makes you wonder if the, the Bible is correct, the Hebrew text where um, the Old Testament, as above, same, so below. I don't know. It's interesting to me. If the cosmos is a brain, and we're all living inside a brain, then we're no more real than the dream characters in our own dreams. This fungus seems to be pretty smart. It, wouldn't you have to be smarter than the host if you're going to hijack your host to make it do something you want it to do? And so this fungus gets inside the, the ant brain and it tells, drives it up a tree and plants it, and then it grows and it sprouts and it re, repeats the process. Scientists have discovered Fungus have 50 words, vocabularies. Now, most of them have like 20, 15 or 20 words, but for the most part, they could have up to 50 words, and we've translated their language. That doesn't mean they're sentient, but they're using language to do things. That's interesting to me. Fungus, if cells are smarter than we think they are, and that's a scientific paper, um, that means their cell intelligence we now have evidence for fungal intelligence. Bacteria or parasites, um, it doesn't have to be a bacteria, but there's some parasites that will hijack this mouse, run it over the cat, the cat eats it, and it completes the life cycle in the stomach of the cat, and the cat poops out the eggs. And so we may not be in charge. Think that, that book, Who's in Charge? It failed to bring in the parasite question. Um, or the bacteria question. Because here's another thing. This fat rat and skinny rat made the news because you can irradiate a rat that's aggressive 
and do a fecal transplant. They move the poop from another rat to the rat they irradiate. And so you take a peaceful rat's poop and give it to the aggressive rat. It becomes peaceful. If you irradiate the peaceful mouse and put the poop from the aggressive mouse in the passive mouse, it becomes aggressive. If you take the skinny poop into the fat mouse, it becomes skinny. And if you take the fat poop into the skinny mouse, it becomes skinny. And this has been duplicated one time in humans where a person with colon cancer was irradiated, had the cancer treatment. She was given the bacteria, a fecal transplant from a family member who had weight problems. And for the first time in her life, she started having weight thing, problems that she couldn't control. Dieting didn't work. Exercise didn't work. And it turns out it was because the bacteria is controlling her, not her. We are not who we think we are. And they're showing that with fecal transplants, we may be able to reverse aging. You could have the skin of a 30-year-old. You could be 70 years old and the skin of a 30-year-old by doing this part protocol. And we've seen regression of... Um, Parkinson's disease and other um, neurological effects due to aging reverse and you have thinking like a 30-year-old by just fecal transplants. We are not who we think we are and we are not alone. <laughs> and, and that's because you're a host of flora and fauna that have a say in your life. And I think that's interesting because that, that brings us to bugs. And I'll come back to that one. That's like three more slides ahead. Scientists saying bugs may actually have feelings. Love bugs may actually have love. Flies have anxiety. If a fly bumps into a window and there's no flies on the windowsill, it has less anxiety than the fly bumping into a window with dead flies on the windowsill. I don't know how they measured it, but flies apparently do not like seeing dead flies, especially when they're bumping into an invisible barrier. They freak out. Plants talk to each other. They share nutrients. They make sounds that are actually in the auditory range. Most humans can't hear them because of the volume level. But with microphones, scientists have discovered they actually make sounds. And if they're under stress, if they're getting eaten, bothered, pinched, they make noises showing they're stressed. They will share nutrients with other trees. In drought conditions, they will share nutrients only with kin they can recognize their offspring versus other trees. Interestingly enough, in a forest, if you've ever wondered how to do new tree saplings take effect when they can't get any sun in the shade, it's because the trees around them move their limbs to allow sunlight to shine directly on them. If that's not communication, I don't know what is. This guy is Cleve Baxter back in the days, in the 70s, and he, he actually had a, um, a helper. His name was Ingo Swan, <laughs> which uh, it's just crazy how this is all connected. It, you can't make this stuff up. He discovered that if you hooked lie detectors up to plants and you spoke nicely to plants, they responded with a certain way. And if you threatened the plant, they responded in a different way. And it showed that plants were actually intimidated by our threats. They were affected by how we spoke to them. Turns out, not just how you speak to them. You think about catching a plant on fire, it responded stressfully. That's evidence for ESP. What's interesting is you kept threatening the plant, it would eventually get immune to you, because it would think you're, well, you're not really doing that. Interestingly, um, they would cook a lobster in a pot, and the plant responded to the lo what appears to be the suffering of the lobster before it died. That's interesting. They took this a bit further. They took cells from the plant and put it in a Petri dish and hooked it up to the lie detector, and they poked the plant, and the cells in the Petri dish responded the same way the plant responded. Curious, they took samples from a human and put them in a Petri dish, hooked them up to the lie detector, and they poked the human, and the cells in the Petri dish responded. <laughs> they took that human, and they put him on the other side of New York City, and they poked him, and in real time, the cells in the dish responded simultaneously with the guy being poked, which doesn't necessarily mean telepathy. It could be evidence for entanglement, but if entanglement's involved in telepathy, then scientists are lying to us or just flat out being ignorant by not wanting to explore this further. <clears throat> 
The Divided Mind and The Heart's Code are both books you should read if you're interested in talking to your subconscious and or realizing that memory is not limited to the brain. Both of these books will give you some insight into that. Many of our illnesses are psychosomatic. That's probably why placebos work. Placebos cure because you believe they worked, even though they're just sugar pills. All right. Um, you can if, there, if your illness is psychosomatic and you believe yourself and you say, this is psychosomatic, I want the pain to go away, it'll probably go away. That's an interesting thing. It's been measured. It happens. It doesn't happen for everyone. Um, I tend to not believe myself, but that's another story. But then again, I did get success with Loxy, and so I'm, I'm learning to work with my unconscious. Um, and maybe this is steps and degrees. The heart's code suggests that heart transplants resulted in memory transference, and it gives you lots of details of stories of that happening. But what's interesting to me is it wasn't just heart transplants. Even blood transplants could result in memory transfer. That's in the book. I recommend reading it. This person here is, I forget her name, but the video is linked in the, in the notes if you, if you find the notes. Um, she was taking hooks out of the sh mouths of sharks. So people fish, sharks get away, um, but the hooks stay in there and they cause the sharks discomfort. This person removed the hooks and any other debris caught on, on them. And to a one, the sharks showed gratefulness. It's not something I expected from the sharks because I was influenced by um, Jaws. But I've been swimming with sharks. I, I, I've scuba dived with sharks. I haven't been eaten. That doesn't mean you won't get eaten. Um, but maybe we don't think about animals correctly. This is an octopus. It was captured by um, a fisherman. It was wounded. It was missing a leg. And it was given to a scientist for study. And it seemed to have a pretty good life. But what was interesting about it is they would catch it dreaming, and it would have a, they, they believe it was having nightmares, as evidenced by it would wake itself up shooting ink and go hide, and then it would come out of hiding and it's like, go back to normal life. So if they have PTSD, that's interesting. Also interesting about octopus is they think, it's, there's a scientific paper that asked the question, are these fellows aliens? They don't seem to match any evolutionary thing, and they seem to be smarter than, than, than they seem to be smarter than humans. They're almost all brain. Um, it, they're really interesting creatures. And there's a story of an octopus being rescued that came back and showed gratefulness to the people that rescued it. That's that's meaningful, isn't it? Dolphins have language for each other. We've known this for a while. They don't call them. They have names, but they call them echolocations or echosignatures, some stupid things like that. Really, a name by any other thing would still smell as sweet. I don't know. Um, but they also have language. They You can't take a dolphin from this pod in the Atlantic, go to the Pacific, drop it in there, and hope it'll do well. They won't speak the same language. Um, there's a lot of interesting studies about dolphins. Um, including this this one where they were trying to get them to do new things and they were about to give up because the dolphins were frustrated, the humans were frustrated. But once the dolphins, dolphins figured out what we were trying to communicate, they gave us something new every time we gave the signal. They're, they're, not, they're not human, but they're sentient. And, and I would argue that they are where we were before writing. Now, they're never going to have writing. They don't have opposable thumbs. You can't make paper in an aquatic environment. They do use tools. They've used rocks to smash things open to eat the inside. Um, but when we put AI smart buoys in the ocean, and the AI learns to speak to dolphins, and they start recording their history, they'll start to advance the same way that we've advanced. This dog here is Chaser. He has 1,022 nouns that he knows. And he can use some verbs and structures to go go and collect items, go get a new item that he's never seen before. If, if this ain't the smartest dog in the world, I don't know what smarts is. And I don't know a pet owner yet that doesn't think their pet is sentient. Maybe not human, different. Sentient in the sense it's aware, 
They have saved owners. They have saved strangers. Um, and humans will, go, will sacrifice their lives to save dogs. That's been demonstrated over and over again. Dolphins have saved humans um, from drowning. How is that not relevant in terms of considering sentience? Coco the gorilla is one of my favorites. If you don't believe in non-human intelligence after reading Coco's story, uh, I might wonder about you. Now, Coco asked for a kitten, well, and they kind of debated it, but they gave her a kitten, and she treated the kitten nicely, and the kitten had more range than the, um, Coco, and it got itself run over. And they, they explained this to Coco, and Coco communicated. She was sad that this hurt. Um, it was uncomfortable, right? Um, she met Robin Williams. She, knew, she seemed to know who Robin Williams was. Um, did she really? Well, that's a great question, and I will answer that question by introducing you to this image. She used to watch Mr. Rogers. She watched him every day. Mr. Rogers learned this, and he asked if he could meet Coco. And they said, of course, come over. First thing that happened was Coco grabbed Rogers up into a hug, then set him on the floor and took his shoes off and set him aside. If that's not abstract, I don't know what is. <laughs> She communicates very clearly language. And if we don't believe in non-human intelligence, when we've got this right in front of us, and it, consider all the life on Earth in terms of degrees of sentience, degrees of non-human intelligence, and they're all doing what they need to do, um, we're the so far we're the richest planet in terms of um, non-human intelligence life, multiple intelligent creatures simultaneously, us, gorillas, dolphins, octopus, and you don't think the rest of the universe is full of non-human life, I don't think you're doing math well. This thing here is an image of these monkeys eating sweet potatoes, and there's this thing called a morphogenic field. They gave monkeys on all these little islands um, um, sweet potatoes. One of them learned to wash the sand off because didn't really like eating the sand with the sweet potato. And suddenly, after a certain number of monkeys started washing them, every island had monkeys washing, the, washing their potatoes, even those out of line sight of, of the other monkeys. And no one could explain that. How did, how did this get transmitted? Do monkeys have a collective unconscious just like humans? Is there a morphogenic field? What are we talking here? So here's a gorilla caught spearfishing. Is it monkey see, monkey do? They watch some natives do it, and now it's going to imitate it? I don't know. Um, are they advancing just like we're advancing because everything evolves? This talks about the morphogenic field. All living organisms operate within this field. What I find interesting is it reminds me of Star Wars, um, Obi-Wan. The Force is this field that penetrates, it's generated by all life, but it penetrates us all and penetrates and surrounds the galaxy. And I submit to you, Star Trek is the same thing because they go through this galactic force field that once they pass through it, it enhances ESP, but it's probably generated by the galaxy itself. They didn't really dealt that, but there's correspondence. Um, is the morphogenic field real? Well, if we share archetypes, it requires a medium so that the collective unconscious might be that medium. Archetypes can only be functional entities if they exist within us. Do we share fields? Like, if the monkeys have their own fields, can we get into that because we're pretty close? Or everybody's got their own field? I don't know. I don't, I don't know how to do this, really, except to go with this. And this is the last section. Um, this image here is the Global Consciousness Project, in which they put random number generators all over the world, and they started monitoring them. And when supernatural events happen, no, that's the wrong way to say it. When major events happen, like Fukushima, 9-11, the random number generators ceased generating random numbers. If it was a local event, the local generator stopped. But 9-11 and Fukushima, every random number generator, RNG, stopped producing random numbers all over the world. 
This is significant. It stopped 15 minutes before the actual event. That suggests something was going on prior to the event or something at the event traveled through time to communicate this. And if time is an illusion, which is something Einstein believed, um, then we're, not, we're navigating something different than what we think we are. Um, this picture here is an image of the World Trade Center on an album by the coup. Um, the artist says, I got this great picture. I just drank this thing last night, and um, here it is. And they said, yeah, let's run with that. And then the World Trade Center happened a week later, and they took this album cover away. How do you explain that? No, maybe this is just a random incident. Somebody had a dream of the World Trade Tower on fire, and we can just blow it off. Except it's not the first time. This comic book was in the 1950s. It shows the face on Mars and astronauts exploring it. Um, is there correspondence with that and the face on Mars as the image given to us by NASA? I don't know. Probably not. Unless all creative writing is essentially remote viewing, and we sometimes tap into things that are real, and that's why there's correspondence in fiction and writing. I'm going to show you that again. The Wreck of the Titan. This book is about the Titanic, before the Titanic was even known to exist, before it sank. But it's a playbook with everything except, um, what's his name, um, Capra, what, the actor that was in the James Cameron version. I don't know. <laughs> so this is interesting to me. This doesn't mean that it's time travel or seeing the future. It's just another thing that lines up as correspondence to if we allow it. This album, um, Leonard Skinner, shows the one on the right with the fire was the first album cover. They changed it to the black one. But one of the ladies, they were supposed to go somewhere together, and she didn't want to get on the airplane because she thought it was going to crash. Everyone told her it's not going to crash. Let's go. But she refused to go. The plane crashed. Some of the people died in the fire, and they changed the album cover. I don't know. Dinar Coots, this book, shows COVID coming from a Wuhan lab prior to there being a COVID. And they talk about art. Is this accident? I don't think he actually knew this. Otherwise, he's part of a conspiracy that needs to be um, investigated, right? I'm not saying he needs to be investigated. I think there's something to this remote viewing and psychic ability and maybe time being more fluid than we imagine. Um, Eureka. A poem by Edgar Allan Poe describes the cosmos and black holes before anyone knew anything about galaxies and black holes and stuff. This, what, what is this? But most infamous, famously is his poem book, um, the, the only book I think, is um, the narrative of author Gordon Pym of Nantucket, in which this boat of fiction um, sank and four people survived. They ate a turtle, but they didn't have enough food and so somebody had to volunteer to be cannibalized. His name was Richard Parker. 46 late years later, it happened in real life. A ship sunk. Four people were on it. They ate a turtle and then Richard Parker became the next thing eaten. Well, how do you make that out? And if your name is Richard Parker, are you ever getting on a boat? The Damon by Anthony Peake covers all of these kinds of things and more. I recommend this book. Um, and not only is the universe stranger than we think, it's stranger than we can think. If this is true, how do we not believe there is non-human intelligence? And so, Gary, do you have any questions for me? This is the end. <laughs> I think non-human intelligence has been here for thousands of years. So. Yeah, I don't disagree with you, sir. So that was the presentation. I've added a few slides since the first one, and um, um, there you go. Yeah, I learned some things. All right, I'm going to turn this off, unless you want to talk about anything um, in here before I do. No, just that I learned some things. That's very interesting. All right. Well, thank you for attending, Gary. Um, I look forward to seeing you at the next meeting. Oh, okay. Don't don't hang up. I'm just turning off the video here. Okay.